Oh, okay, there she is. I'm sending you the mic right now, Chief. Let me find the give you co-host right quick. I sent you the there it goes. Okay. I just yes. gotta find the where we stopped at right quick. So that's why you'll hear me call. Sounds good. Mm, what was I looking for? All my bookmarks. So I can put this in the jumbo trunk. Mm, thank you. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. We left off on 17 patrolling. What page is that? And it's showing up as 134, 133. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll just go ahead and get started. So um, this is going to be a quote from James Baldwin, Fifth Avenue, Uptown, Nobody Knows My Name. And the quote starts, the only way to police a ghetto is to be oppressive. None of the police commissioners, men, even with the best will in wait, the world. Wait, wait, Pen. Um, I just saw a thumbs down. Can you not hear us in the listeners? Oh, you can hear us. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought that thumbs down that we couldn't be, we weren't heard. Oh, okay. Um, the only way to police a ghetto is to be oppressive. None of the police commissioners, men, even with the best will in the world, have any way of understanding the lives led by the people they swagger about in twos and threes controlling. Their very presence is an insult, and it would be, even if they spent their entire day feeding gun drops to children. They represent the force of the white world, and that world's real intentions are simply for the world's criminal profit and ease to keep the black men corralled up here in his place. That's James Baldwin, Fifth Avenue, Uptown. Nobody knows my name. Um, let's see, patrolling. It was the spring of 1966. Still without a definite program, we were at the stage of testing ideas that would capture the imagination of the community. We began, as always, by checking around the street brothers. I'm sorry, by checking around with the street brothers. We asked them if they would be interested in forming the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which would be based upon the defending the community against the aggression of the power structure, including the military and the armed might of the police. We informed the brothers of their right to possess weapons. Most of them were interested. Then we talked about how the people are constantly intimidated by arrogant, belligerent police officers and exactly what we could do about it. We went to pool halls and bars, all the places where brothers congregate and talk. I was prepared to give them legal advice. From my law courses at Oakland City College and San Francisco Law School, I was familiar with the California Penal Code and well-versed in the laws relating to weapons. I also had something very important at my disposal, the law library of the North Oakland Service Center, a community center poverty program where Bobby was working. The center gave legal advice, and there were many law books on the shelves. Unfortunately, most of them dealt with civil law, since the anti-poverty program was not supposed to advise poor people about criminal law. However, I made good use of the books they had to run down the full legal situation to brothers on the street. We were doing what the poverty program claimed to be doing but never had, giving help and counsel to poor people about the things that crucially affected their lives. All that summer, we circulated in the Black communities of Richmond, Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. Wherever brothers gathered, we talked with them about their right to arm. In general, they were interested but skeptical about the weapons idea. They could not see anyone walking around with a gun in full view. To recruit any sizable number of street brothers, we could, we would obviously have to do more than talk. We needed to give practical applications of our theory, show them that we were not afraid of weapons and not afraid of death. The way we finally won the brothers over was by patrolling the police with arms. Before we began the patrols, however, Bobby and I sat down and writing a practical course of action. 
we could go no further without a program, and we resolved to drop everything else, even though it might take a while to come up with something viable. One day, we went to the North Oakland Service Center to work it out. The center was an ideal place because of the books and the fact that we could work undisturbed. First, we pulled together all the books we had been reading and dozens we had only heard about. We discussed Mao's program, Cuba's program, and all the others, but concluded that we could not follow any of them. Our unique situation required a unique program. Although the relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed is universal, forms of oppression vary. The ideas that mobilized the people of Cuba and China sprang from their own history and political structures. The practical parts of those programs could be carried out only under a certain kind of oppression. Our program had to deal with America. I started wrapping up the essential points for the survival of Black and oppressed people in the United States. Bobby wrote them down, and then we separated those ideas into two sections, what we want and what we believe. We split them up because the ideas fell naturally into two distinct categories. It you was necessary. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was necessary to explain why we wanted certain things. At the same time, our goals were based on beliefs, and we set those out too. In the section on beliefs, we made it clear that all objective conditions necessary for attaining our goals were already in existence, but that a number of societal factors stood in our way. This was to help people understand what was working against them. All in all, our 10-point program took about 20 minutes to write. Thinking it would take days, we prepared for a long session, but we never got to the small mountain of books piled up around us. We had come to an important realization. Books could only point in a general direction. The rest was up to us. This is the program we wrote down. October 1966, Black Panther Party, platform and program, what we want, what we believe. Point number one, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our Black community. We believe that Black people will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. Point number two, we want full employment for our people. We believe that the government, federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or a guaranteed income. We believe that if the white American businessman will not give full employment, that then the means of production should be taken from the businessman and placed in a community so that the people of the community can organize and employ all of its people and give a high standard of living. Wake up the universal basic income in the... Anyway. Um, point three... We want an end to the robbery by capitalists of our Black community. We believe that this racist government has robbed us, and we are, and now we are demanding the overdue debt of 40 acres and two mules. 40 acres and two mules were promised 100 years ago as restitution for slave labor and mass murder of Black people. We will accept the payment in currency, which will um, be distributed in our many communities. The Germans are now aiding the Jews in Israel for the genocide of the Jewish people. The Germans murdered 6 million Jews, and the Black the American racist has taken part in the slaughter of over 50 million Black people. Therefore, we feel that this is the modest demand we, um, we demand that we make. And if these niggas didn't just read the rest of the party and didn't just stop at that one, we might make it somewhere. But let me stop. Point number four, we want decent housing, fit for shelter of human beings. We believe that white landlords will not give us decent housing to our black community. Then the housing and the land should be made into cooperatives so that our community with government aid can build and make decent housing for its people. Point five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches our, us our true history and our role in present day society. We believe in an educational system that will give our people the knowledge of self. If a man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society and the world, then he has little chance to relate to anything else. Point number six, we want all black men to be exempt from the military service. We believe that black people should not be forced to fight in the military service to defend a racist government that does not protect us. We will not fight and kill other people of color in the world who, like black people, are being victimized by the white racist government of America. We will protect ourselves from the force and violence of racist police and the racist military by whatever means necessary. Point number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of Black people. We believe we can end police brutality in our Black community by organizing Black self-defense groups that are dedicated to defending our Black community from racist police oppression and brutality. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States gives the right to bear arms. 
Um, we therefore believe that all Black people should arm themselves for self-defense. Do you want to take the rest or you want me to keep going? Oh, sorry, I was talking on mute. <laughs> okay, so point eight. We want freedom for all Black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We believe that all Black people should be released from the many jails and prisons because they have not received a fair and impartial trial. We want all Black people when brought up to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their Black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. We believe that the courts should follow the United States Constitution so that Black people receive fair trials. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution gives a man a right to be tried by his peer group. A peer is a person from a similar economic, social, religious, and geographical, environmental, historical, and racial background. To do this, the court will be forced to select a jury from the Black community from which the Black defendant came. We have been and are being tried by all white juries that have no understanding of the average reasoning man of the Black community. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. And as our major political objective, the United Nations supervised plebiscite to be held throughout the Black colony in which only Black colonial subjects would be allowed to participate for the purpose of determining the will of Black people as to their national destiny. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should, that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident and that all men are created equal, but that Oh, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. And to institute, an inst I'm sorry, um, an institute, there you go, a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments, along established, should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experiences have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariable, invariably the same object invents a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. With the program on paper, we set up the structure of our organization. Bobby became chairman, and I chose the position of Minister of Defense. I was very happy with this arrangement. I do not like to lead formally, and the chairman has to conduct meetings and be involved in administration. We also discuss having an advisory cabinet as an information arm of the party. We wanted this cabinet to do research on each of the 10 points in their relation to the community and the advice of people on how to implement them. It seemed best to wait the political wing of the party with street brothers and the advisory cabinet with middle-class blacks who had the necessary knowledge and skills. We were also seeking a functional unity, unity between middle-class blacks and the street brothers. I asked my brother Melvin to approach a few friends about serving on the advisory cabinet, but when our plan became clear, they all refused and the cabinet was deferred. The first member of the Black Panther Party after Bobby and myself was little Bobby Hutton. Little Bobby, had met Bobby Seale at the North Oakland Service Center, where both were working, and he immediately became enthusiastic about the nascent organization. Even though he was only about 15 years old then, he was a responsible and mature person, determined to help the cause of Black people. He became the party's first treasurer. Little Bobby was the youngest of seven children, and his family came to, had come to Oakland from Arkansas when he was three years old. His parents were good, hardworking people, but Bobby had endured some hard 
the same hardships and humiliations to which so many black young blacks and poor communities are subjected. Like many of the brothers, he had been kicked out of school. Then he had gotten a part-time job at the service center. After work, he used to come around to Bobby Seal's house to talk and learn and, and learn to read. At the time of his murder, he was reading Black Reconstruction in America by W.E.B. Du Bois. Bobby was a serious revolutionary, but there was nothing grim about him. He had an infectious smile and a disarming quality that made people love him. He died courageously, the first Black Panther to be um, to make the supreme sacrifice for the people. We all attempt to carry on the work he began. We started now to implement our 10-point program. Interested primarily in educating and revolutionizing the community, we needed to get their attention and give them something to identify with. This is why the seventh point, police action, was the first program we emphasized. Point seven stated, we want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of Black people. This is a major issue in every Black community. The police have never been our protectors. Instead, they act as a military arm of our oppressors and continuously brutalize us. Many communities have tried and failed to get civilian review boards to supervise the behavior of the police. In some places, organized citizen patrols have followed the police and observed them in their community dealings. They take pictures and make tape recordings of the encounters and report misbehavior to the authorities. However, the authorities responsible for overseeing the police are policemen themselves and usually side against the citizens. We recognize that it was ridiculous to report police to police, but we hope that by raising encounters to a higher level, by patrolling the police with arms, we will see a change in their behavior. Further, the community would notice this and become interested in the party. Thus, our armed patrols were also a means of recruiting. At first, the patrols were a total success. Frightened and confused, the police did not know how to respond because they had never encountered patrols like this before. They were familiar with the community alert patrols in other cities, but never had, but never before had guns been an integral part of any patrol program. With weapons in our hands, we were no longer their subjects, but their equals. Out on patrol, we stopped whenever we saw police questioning a brother or a sister. We would walk over with our weapons and observe them from a quote-unquote safe distance so that the police could not say we were interfering with their performance of their duty. We would ask the community members if they were being abused. Most of the time when a police saw us coming, he slipped his book back into his pocket, got into his car, and left in a hurry. Wake that up. The citizens who had been stopped were as amazed as the police at our sudden appearance. I always carried law books in my car. Sometimes when a police was har harassing a citizen, I would stand off a little and read the relevant portions of the penal code in a loud voice to all within hearing distance. In doing this, we were helping educate those who gathered to observe these incidents. If the policeman arrested the citizen and took him to the station, we will follow and immediately post bail. Wake that up. Many community people could not believe at first that we had only their interests at heart. Nobody had given them any support or assistance when the police harassed them, but here we were, proud black men, armed with guns and knowledge of the law. Many citizens came right out of jail and into the party, and the statistics of murder and brutality by policemen in our communities fell sharply. Each day we went out on our watch. Sometimes we got on a policeman's tail and followed him with our weapons in full view. If he darted around the block or made a U-turn trying to follow us, we let him do it until he got tired of that. Wake that up! Then we would follow him again. Either way, we took up a good bit of police time that otherwise would have been spent on harassment. As our forces built up, we doubled the patrols, then tripled them. We began to patrol everywhere, Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, and San Francisco. You want me to take up mm -hmm. here? Most patrols were a part of our normal movement around the community. We kept them random, however, so that the police could not set a network to anticipate us. They never knew when or where we were going to show up. It might be late at night or early in the morning. Some brothers would go on patrol the same time every day, but never in a specific pattern or in the same geographical area. The chief purpose of the patrols was to teach the community security against the police, and we did not need a regular schedule for that. We knew that no particular area could be totally defended. Only the community could effectively defend and eventually liberate itself. Our aim was simply to teach them how to go about it. We passed out our literature and 10-point program to the citizens who gathered and discussed community defense and educated them about their rights concerning weapons. All along, 
the number of members grew. The Black Panthers were and are always required to keep their activities within legal bounds. This was emphasized repeatedly in our political education classes and also when we taught weapons care. If we overstep legal bounds, the police would easily gain the upper hand and be able to continue their intimidation. We also knew the community was somewhat fearful of the gun and the policemen who had it. So we studied the law about weapons and kept within our rights. To be arrested for having weapons would be a setback to our program of teaching the people their constitutional right to bear arms. As long as we kept everything legal, the police could do nothing and the people could would see that armed defense was a legitimate constitutional right. In this way, they would lose their doubts and fears and be able to move against the oppressor. It was not all observation and penal code reading on these patrols. The police invariably shocked to meet a cadre of disciplined and armed black men coming to the support of the community reacted in strange and unpredictable ways. In their fright, some of them became children, cursing and insulting us. We responded in kind calling them swine and pigs, but never cursing. This could be cause for arrest, and we took care not to be arrested with our weapons, but we demonstrated their cowardice to the community with our shakabuku. <laughs> what? It was sometimes hilarious to see their reaction. They had always been cocky and sure of themselves as long as they had weapons to intimidate the, um, ar the, I'm sorry, the unarmed community. When we equalized the situation, their real cowardice was exposed. Soon they began to retaliate. We expected this. They had to get back at us in some way, and we were prepared. The fact that we had conquered our fear of death made it possible to face them under any circumstances. The police began to keep a record of Black Panther vehicles. Whenever they spotted one, it would be stopped and investigated for possible violations. This was a childish ploy, but it was the police way. We always made sure our vehicles were clean, uh, without violations, and the police were usually hard-pressed to find any justification for stopping us. Since we were within the law, they soon resorted to illegal tactics. I was stopped and questioned 40 or 50 times by police without being arrested or even getting a ticket in most instances. The few times I did end up on the blotter, it merely proved how far they were willing to go. A policeman once stopped me and examined my license in the car for any violation of the motor or vehicle code. He spent about half an hour going over the vehicle, checking lights, horns, tires, everything. Finally, he shook the rear license plate and a bolt dropped off. So he wrote out a ticket for a faulty license plate. Some encounters with the police were more dramatic. At times they drew their guns and we drew ours until we reached a sort of standoff. This happened frequently to me. I often felt that someday one of the police would go crazy and pull the trigger. Some of them were so nervous that they looked as if they might shake a bullet out of their pistols. I would rather have a brave man pull a gun on me, since he is less likely to panic, but we were prepared for anything. Sometimes they threatened to shoot, thinking I would lose courage, but I remember the lessons of solidarity confine I'm sorry, of solitary confinement and the sign every silly action is proper significance. They were afraid of us. It was as simple as that. Each day we went forth fully aware that we might not come home or see each other again. There is no, there is no closeness to equal that. In front of our first Black Panther office on 58th Street in Oakland, a policeman once drew his gun and pointed it at me while I sat in my car. When people gathered to observe, the police told them to clear the area. I ignored the gun, got out the car, and asked the police to go into the party office. They had a right to observe the police. Period. Then I called the policeman, an ignorant Georgia crocker who had come to the West to get away from sharecropping. God damn. Um, that's the 1960s rundown. Um, after that, I walked around the car and spoke to the citizens about the police and about every man's right to be armed. I took a chance there, but then figured the policeman would not shoot me with all those eyes on him. He was willing to shoot me without cause, I'm sure, but not before so many witnesses. Well, nowadays, child. 
Another policeman admitted as much during an incident in Richmond. I had stopped to watch a motorcycle cop question a citizen. He was clearly edgy at my presence, but I stood up quietly at a reasonable distance with my shotgun in hand. After riding up the citizen, he rode his motorcycle over to me and asked if I wanted to press charges for police brutality. About a dozen people were standing around around watching us. Are you paranoid? I replied. Do you think you're important? Do you think I will waste my time going to the police station to make a report on you? No, you're just a coward anyway. With that, I got into my car. When he tried to hold my door open, I slammed it shut and told him to get his hands off. By humiliation, he drove off, steaming mad. About halfway down the street, he turned around and came back. He wanted to do something. And he was about 50 shades of red. Pulling up beside me, he stuck his head close and said, if it was night, you wouldn't do this. You're right, I replied. I sure wouldn't. But you're threatening me now, aren't you? He got a little red dirt. He got a little redder and kicked his machine into gear and took off. The police wanted me badly, but they needed to do their dirty work out of view of, my, of the community. When a citizen was unarmed, they brutalized him at any time, almost casually. But when he was prepared to defend himself, the police became a little, little more than criminals working at night. On another occasion, I stopped by the Black Panther office after paying some bills from my father. When I was taking care of family business, I had not carried my shotgun with me. It was at home, but I did have a dagger fully sheathed in my belt. In the party, there were two comrades. Uh, in the office, there were two comrades, Warren Tucker, a captain in the party, and another member. As we talked, an 11-year-old boy burst into the office and said, the police are at my friend's house. They're tearing up the place. The house was only three blocks away, and so the two Black Panthers and I hurried to the scene. Warren Tucker had a 45-millimeter um, pistol shopped in his hip in full view, but the other two had, uh, of us had no weapons. We had never kept weapons in the office since we were there only periodically. When we arrived, we found three policemen in the house turning over couches and chairs, searching and pushing a little boy around and shouting, where is the shotgun? The, little bo- the boy kept saying, I don't have a shotgun, but the police went right on looking. I asked the policeman who seemed to be in charge if he had a search warrant, and he answered that he did not need one because he was in quote-unquote hot pursuit. Then he told me to leave the house. The little boy asked me to stay, so I continued to question the police, telling them they had no right to be there. The policeman finally turned on me and said, you're going to have to get out of here, he said. No, I said, you leave, you leave if you don't have a search warrant. In the middle of the argument, the boy's father arrived and also asked the police for a search warrant. When the police admitted they didn't have one, he ordered them out. As they started to leave, one of the policemen stopped in the door and said to the father, Why are you telling us to get out? Why don't you get rid of these Panthers? They're troublemakers. The father replied, Before this, I didn't like the Panthers. I only heard bad things about them. But in the last few minutes, I've changed my mind because they helped myself, my son when you pushed him around. The police became even more outraged at this. All of their hostility now torn towards us. As the whole group went down the steps and out the yard, more policemen arrived at the scene. The the house um, was directly across the street from Oakland City College, and the dozen or so police cars had attracted a crowd that was milling about. The policemen who had been ordered out of the house took new courage at the sight of reinforcements, as they do, pussy-ass niggas. Walking over to me in the yard, he came close saying, you're always making trouble for us. Coming closer still, he growled at me in a low voice that could not be overheard. You motherfucker. This was regular police routine. A transparent strategy. He wanted me to curse him before witnesses. Then he could arrest me. But I had learned to be cautious. After he called me a motherfucker, he stood waiting for the explosion but it did not come in the way he expected. Instead, I called him a swine, a pig, a slimy snake, everything I could think of without using profanity. By now, he was almost, ap- I don't know how to say that word, apopoleptic. You're talking to me like that, and you have a weapon. You're displaying a weapon in a rude and threatening fashion. Then he turned to Warren Tucker. Warren's gun was still in his holster and said, and so are you. As if on signal, the 15 policemen who had been standing around uncertainly stormed the three of us and threw on handcuffs. They did not say they were placing us under arrest. If they had, we would have gladly taken the arrest under circumstances without any resistance. From the way we went hurling off in the paddy wagon, 
with this siren wailing and police cars ahead and behind, you might have thought they had bagged a mafia couple. <laughs> After we were booked, they searched us and found a pen knife in Warren Tucker's pocket, the kind Boy Scouts use. So they dropped the charge of displaying a weapon in a rude and threatening manner and charged him simply with carrying a concealed weapon. Even that charge was eventually dropped. This was the kind of harassment we went through over and over again simply because we chose to exercise our constitutional rights to self-defense and stand up for the community. In spite of the fact that we followed the law to the letter, we were arrested and convicted of all sorts of minor trumped-up charges. They sought to frighten us and turn the community against us. But what they did had the opposite effect. For instance, after this encounter, we gained a number of new members from City College students who had watched the incident and had seen how things really were. They had been skeptical about us earlier because of the bad treatment we had received in the press, but seeing is believing. The policeman who started his, this particular incident testified against me in 1968 in my trial for killing a policeman. When my attorney, Charles Gary, questioned him under cross-examination, he admitted his fear of the Black Panthers. He is six feet tall and weighs 250 pounds. I'm five feet 10 and a half inches and weigh 150 pounds. Yet, he said that I surrounded him. Straying further from the facts, he testified that he had not said anything to me, that on the contrary, he was too frightened to open his mouth. The Black Panthers allegedly frightened him by shaking high-powered rifles in his face, calling him a pig and threatening to kill him. He was fearful, he said, that I would kill him and the dagger, or oh, kill him with the dagger, though it was sheathed. He stated that I had come right up to him and that I was in his face, and he put it, he was all around me, so much for police testimony. In addition to our patrols and confrontations with police, I did a lot of recruiting in pool halls and bars, sometimes working 12 to 16 hours a day. I passed out leaflets with our 10-point program, explaining each point to all who would listen. Going deep into the community like this, I invariably became involved in whatever was happening. This day-to-day -day contact, contact became an important part of our organizing effort. There is a bar restaurant in North Oakland known as the Boston's Locker. I used to call it my office because I was sometimes sitting there for 20 hours straight talking with people who came in. Most of the time, I had my shotgun with me. If the owners of the establishment did not object, if they did, I left it in my car. At other times, I would go to City College or to Oakland Skill Center, anywhere people gathered. It was hard work, but not in the sense of working at an ordinary job with its deadly routine and sense of futility in performing empty labor. It was work that had profound significance for me. The very meaning of my life was in it and brought me closer to the people. This recruiting had an interesting ramification in that I tried to transform many of the so-called criminal activities going on in the street into something political although this had to be done gradually. Instead of trying to eliminate these activities, numbers, hot goods, drugs, I attempted to channel them into significant community actions. Black consciousness had generally reached a point where a man felt guilty about exploiting the black community. However, if, his, if this man felt guilty about exploiting the black, oh, I'm sorry. However, if his daily activities, there we go, for survival could be integrated with actions that undermine the established order, he felt good about it. It gave him a feeling of justification and strengthened his own sense of personal worth. Many of the brothers who were burglarizing and participating in similar pursuits began to contribute weapons and material to community defense. You want me to go? Uh, or? Uh, no, I can finish. Oh, it's only a little bit left. Yeah, That's you, okay. It's, I, I need to see that. You want yeah. to finish that My little problem. part and then I'll go on to the next Godforsaken chapter? <laughs> Yeah, has it already been an hour? It's been like 30 minutes. That's it? Oh, well, right. are you... We could also only do one chapter. Yeah, let's do that. I'll finish this one and we can... Be and done that's good because the next chapter is on Eldridge Cleaver. So oh, <laughs> we can skip that. Not on <laughs> not on the Holy Day, child. Please. <laughs> but go ahead. Finish with that last chapter. Right. In order to survive, they still had to sell their hot goods, but at the same time, they would pass some of the cash on to us. That way, ripping off became more than just an individual thing. Gradually, uh, the Black Panthers came to be accepted in the Bay Area community. We had provided a needed example of strength and dignity by showing people how to defend themselves. More important, we lived among them. 
we could see every day that with us, the people came first. Yo, that was a good one. Especially, like, just the image of them, like, sitting around full of books, like, in a room full of books. And instead of, like, you know, sometimes you go to these things so, quote-unquote, prepared. But then you get there and you realize, yeah, and that thing, these books are not, yeah, like, we everything that we need is right here for us. Um, I love that imagery. It reminds me of so much. I just... Yeah, I just is that's really how it be. <laughs> like you be ready to talk up like you know. Um, but you know that was beautiful. Um, hey trans is beautiful. I saw you grab a mic. Um, yeah. I hope everyone's doing good, having a a pleasant Sunday, as pleasant as it can be under capitalism. Did you have something to share? I'm trying to speak before you just chilling with us. It's okay to just chill too. Oh, um, hello. Um, hi guys. Um, I don't know. I think I accidentally grabbed the mic. I'm sorry. Oh I'm so no, sorry. It, everything, you know. That's I'm glad we got to say hi to you today. <laughs> it was perfect. Yes. Um, so yeah, I just think it was um a good reading. Yeah, just hearing I, I never read that part before. So that was really dope. Yeah. I mean, we can end this space there. We got a chapter knocked out. That's some good work. Child, we'll probably pick it up again. I don't want to <laughs> read that next chapter. <laughs> we can always skip it. It's all good. I don't want to read about that nigga. I hate that nigga. Actually, no, I feel like people really do need to read about that nigga because people be realizing, like, actually, let me shut up. Because they don't realize mm-hmm. how violent misogyny breaks up black movement. Like, y'all don't, y'all think that, like, niggas is just trying to get y'all to stop being fucking misogynistic and transphobic and homophobic just because, like, we feel like it. Like, oh, just, <laughs> you know, that's just what we feel like talking about today. No, niggas been ruining social movements over shit like this for a minute. Like, get get it together. Like, get your politics in line so we could go, uh, like, wild out against these crackers. Because y'all motherfuckers... <sighs> anyway. So we yeah. actually do need to read that shit about Aldous Cleaver because these niggas lost the plot. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's the next space. So that's chapter, what, 18? It's going to be Eldritch Cleaver. Yeah. Uh, Contradiction. Yeah, just, I guess. Yeah. Um, grab the mic. Hey, you want to say something? Yeah, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, yo. This was a good space. So thank you all. Um, it's always good. And then because no one's cursing, I can actually have my son sit with me and we listen. I put on the Bluetooth. So um, that's always a good thing. Oh, uh, but he left, so I'm back to my ignorant shit. Um, what up, niggas? Um, anyways, good to hear it from you, Penn. Um, I haven't been in here. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to shout out. This was a really good space. Um, I'm glad it's, like, appearing. Now. It wasn't coming up in my, um, you know when we had, like, the spaces up top? When you're in your home, it wasn't coming up. So I'm glad I was able to catch it today. But, um, yeah, so... That's all I wanted to say. Happy Sunday, and I hope all of you are doing well. And I hope to um, I hope there are more uh, reading spaces from Pen and Choose. So yeah, thank you. Period. Yeah, thank you. Also, um, y'all can put on notifications for Pen and Paper, and y'all will see every time she makes a reading space. Um, everything she says and just in general dro- dope. I feel like we all know that, so it's good to have notifications on for her. But definitely, if you're interested in catching the reading spaces, um, that's something you can do. Um, but yeah. But yo, can we have some spaces that are just like us all chopping it up without it being recorded? Because um, well, you already know. Choose. Look at you live, but I'm trying. You know what I mean? This. Is recorded. Um, I be so. telling pen and paper, she need to just host all the spaces. We just want to hear her voice. We want to hear her reading. We want to hear her talking. So it's up to her. She just be, you know. Y'all, y'all hear how nasty she be talking to me? You like, said what? Uh, I said y'all hear Yo, how nasty you she be talking married, to me? You niggas get married, right? Um, I want y'all to have a bouquet of 
of weed flowers, right? Because that's flowers <laughs> too. And um, I'm moving back. To, I'm moving back to New York soon, so I don't want you little niggas. Uh, let me not say niggas anymore. I'm really trying not to. Um, but um, yeah, invite me and throw that bouquet of that three ounces of fucking weed, and uh, we go from there. You know what I mean? You're so, gonna be our flower boy. There, there you go. What do they call that? Yeah. Um, what do they say that black boy joy when you got flowers. So there's that flower that I need. Mm. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh. So yeah, if y'all, I don't know, choose. Did you want to open up a space later on today? That's just y'all chilling you know, and relaxing. I haven't opened up a peaceful place in a long time. Oh. But I like your spaces, pen and paper. I just be reading those. I like just. And you see me, I, my finger be over that little end button because I'd be like, I'm not really trying to talk to all y'all niggas. I'd be trying to talk to Choose and then Girl, that's it. Bye. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. So... All right. All right. <laughs> Why would you say that? Why would you say that? <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, a I'm glad y'all come to these spaces. I understand when you date someone, it's like, fuck the rest of these Avatar niggas. Um... Not Avatar <laughs> niggas, please. Um,. <laughs> No, but on a serious note, I hope everyone. Holy is shit! I mean, well. Elder, Elder Dancer Tree, it's so good to be in the same room as you. Period. I hope all is. I hope all is well with you. You are a beautiful soul, and um, Choose was telling me to use my cursing words. You know, obviously, I would never curse in your space with you, Elder. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. Uh. I'm just dancing, chase your cousin the mic, and then we to get Please. To I just said, stop calling people nigglets if they don't want to be called nigglets. Yo, choose. I don't, I don't apologize at nauseum. At this Wait, point. hold on. Dancing tree is here. Hey. Oh, my, okay, my Hi, everybody. I was just saying good afternoon. Uh, when you were getting ready to read that section on Eldridge Cleaver, I was just, I just sent choose violence a message, and I was attempting to retype it because I couldn't copy it to pen and paper. Um, in 1970, when I was a student at Wilberforce, I distinctly remember a whole group of us, because I was part of a little group of, <laughs> you all remind me so much. Pen, my sister, who's so full of fire, reminds me so damn much of myself. I just crack up when I hear some of the things you say, because it's almost the exact words I said when I was like 25 and 30. But anyway, I remember clearly uh, Kathleen Cleaver's photograph on the front of the Black Panther newspaper with black eyes and swollen lips where Eldridge had beaten her ass when they were in exile in Algeria. And he had also brought a young Arab girl into the house over Kathleen. And that's when he was expelled from the party. I clearly remember the front page of that newspaper. And if I can dig up a copy and find a copy, because I've got all kind of old stuff here. I gave away most of my Black Panther stuff to a sister down in Maryland because I think she needed it more than I did and she needed it. She had something she had to do so I made the sacrifice and gave most of it to her. But yeah, speaking of Eldridge, you know, that's my clear memory of him. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Thank you all. <laughs> no, thank, thank you. you. It hits different when, like you say it, Cause I'm not gonna lie, like I've I never seen it, but I've always heard it from like my elders that that nigga was just straight trash. But to say for to hear someone who said, yeah, I picked up a newspaper and kind of like how we saw, like like we see people like get beat up or whatever, or like people are um, being abused. It hits different when you're exposed to it that way. So uh, yeah, I'm really glad you said that because. There's a lot of like revisionist history going on um, right now on social media in regards to like a pr prominent members in the Black Panther Party <clears throat> and like naming like I saw a post the other day that was just like um, naming the part on Soul on Ice where he was saying that, you know, he was a rapist. They're like, no, that's in the beginning of the book. You don't understand. Like, obviously, he's going back and saying all the negative things he did. Like, you can't judge him for that. Malcolm X in the beginning of the book. And I was like, wait, these two things are not the same. These two, these, these are not the same. And, like, all that revisionist history, like, to just say, like, I hear you say, like, no, I remember when that happened. That nigga didn't change. That nigga went out just the way he came in. Like, 
So yeah, no. Child. Yeah, it's heavy. So are you gonna have a space? Choose one of your peaceful spaces where people can just politic and talk about Elgin Cleaver. Hell no! No, I mean just in general. (laughs) Nah, just in general. Sounds like people want to talk and get some shit off. I mean, if you can, if you can spare an hour, pen, um, because it seems like we're on your schedule. And I'm fine with that. Oh, I, um, I, I live in Penn's world, so yeah, I'm on her schedule. <laughs> yes, and yeah. um, niggas always like, yo, why you always go hard for Penn? You know she's a lesbian, and I, I, you know, Penn, I, Penn, you know for a fact. Wait, I've, what? No, I'm saying, I, what, what I'm saying is, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> no. North, yo, we going into space and we can talk about it so it's not on record. Oh, you yeah, gotta edit yeah. this shit out. Edit the last. Yeah, we I cannot got you. edit it out. I got we you. cannot. We can't edit it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this space. Pen so I got you. All y'all take care. I'm so happy that y'all came to the space. Please continue coming. And yeah, we'll have spaces that are not recorded so we can just chop it up. So y'all take, take care. care. And again, let's get free. Thanks for coming. <laughs>